We're going to break bread today thinking about the Lord Jesus in his glory, in his transfiguration. So then we're going to focus on him and the, the wonder of who he really is, as we see memorialized really in, in this bread and wine. And to think how we can have a part in all that wonder. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you quietly and calmly to focus upon your Son and to naturally think about our relationship with him. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will guide the thinking of each and every one of us, because, Father, he is the one whom we love. He is the one we fain would be and live eternally with. Please be with us, Father, and help us to see the huge possibilities that there are in relationship with him, both now and forever and ever. Please, Father, bless all of us, all in the body of Jesus, all those trying to follow him in weakness and in difficulty. Please help us, Father, and strengthen us and give us the vision firm to the end of him before us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, the Lord clearly was given this uh, experience, this, this vision, this transfiguration, to encourage him, Luke says in his record, for the exodus that he was to accomplish at Jerusalem, that is, for his death that was upcoming. And so he had this vision of Moses and, uh, and Elijah appearing to him and encouraging him. And Jesus appears in glory. I think the idea is that this was a, a kind of a vision of the kingdom, of how he would ultimately be. And one take then on the kingdom is that it's all about relationship. It's about him talking with Moses and Elijah. Well, I'd just like to point out that he appears in this bright, shining garment. And we're told that it was whiter than any fuller could ever fool. That is, uh, a fuller was somebody who, who dyed garments. And the whiteness of the garment of Jesus really struck the Peter, James, and John. And I, I suggest that Mark's gospel is actually Peter's thoughts, but that's, uh, that's another story. The point is, the brightness struck them. The glory struck them. And what is this idea of it being made whiter than possibly we could imagine? Well, we are told that we also can dip our robes in the blood of the Lamb, which we remember in the, in the cup of wine, and that our garments can likewise be like his, can likewise be as white as his. That, that's because through his blood, through the forgiveness that we are given, we are counted as him. Righteousness is imputed to us, as Paul would put it in Romans. But why this emphasis on, on how amazingly white he was, whiter than they had ever seen. Talk about whiter than white. Whiter than any fuller, any person who dyed garments it could ever achieve. Well, I think the allusion is to the Old Testament, and it is to how David says in Psalm 51, 17, Wash me. This is after his sin with Bathsheba, Uriah, and so on. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Literally, fool me. It's the same word. Fool my garments. Wash me, and, and dye my garments. Well, his garments, as I say, were whiter than they could ever possibly imagine white could be. And I think the point is that when that's applied to us... It means that this is a forgiveness of a quality and a dimension and a nature that cannot be experienced in, in human terms. And I think that is because in all our human experience of failure, sin, forgiveness, saying sorry and all that, the forgiveness is only human. For all you know, the guy may forgive you, but then he might raise it again next year. Or he may forgive you and actually forget you ever did it and sort of uh, downplay, even in his own mind, what you actually did. There is, however, with God, a forgiveness that is of a different nature. For example, in the parable of the debtors, you know, the man with a huge debt 
comes to his master and he frankly forgives him. Now, the frankness of that forgiveness, I suggest, is quite different to what we can achieve. Forgiveness typically is a process. I, I don't buy the stories about, oh, well, I just decided to forgive him and I did it. Well, maybe you you might do if somebody spilt their coffee on your, <laughs> on your jacket or on your shirt or on your skirt or whatever it might be. Yes, okay. Uh, but with bigger things, I really do think that forgiveness has to be a process with human beings. That's my experience of granting forgiveness and being granted it. It, it is finally a process. Whereas God can frankly forgive, as is said in the parable. So, it seems to me that this is the difficulty in believing and feeling of the forgiveness that is kind of symbolized in this wine, in this blood of Jesus. That the difficulty is, this is a forgiveness, the nature of which we have not actually experienced in secular worldly life. And yet, this is what it is to know God and to know the Lord Jesus, to be in relationship with them. It is to believe and to know that actually they have forgiven me and I am whiter than snow and I can look forward by grace, confidently, as David did, to the kingdom. So then, <clears throat> they are taken up a mountain, aren't they? Peter, James and John with Jesus. And quite clearly, this whole thing is looking forward, uh, sorry, looking back uh, to Moses. When he goes up the mountain, he enters into the cloud. We are told that, and we are told that specifically here, that the cloud overshadowed them, similar to maybe God hiding Moses in the cleft of the rock with his hand and then revealing his, taking his hand off, and Moses sees the back parts of God Almighty. And we are told that the three of them went up. And that's what happened the first time Moses ascended. He took three people with him. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. And so they are being set up as if they have ascended Sinai and seen something greater than what Moses saw. Now Hebrews 12 alludes to this and, and says that then... The earth shook, and Sinai trembled, and Moses trembled, and the mountain burned with fire. But we have come to the blood of Jesus, which speaks even greater things, which is a voice more powerful than the voice that shook Sinai. And so, in Judaism, Moses' ascent of Sinai and his meeting with God there was seen as the absolute pinnacle of, of spirituality. And Moses was the greatest man who'd ever lived, the one who got closest to God. And wow, well, this was the absolute zenith, the absolute acme of spirituality, Judaism, religion, and whatever. And these three ordinary guys, Peter, James, and John, who were very ordinary, they were fishermen, and Peter gets up and preaches the day of Pentecost, they mock him that these are unlearned and ignorant men, a grammatas, without grammar. These are fellows who didn't even finish synagogue, you know, Sabbath school. These are guys who can't read or write. That's what they're saying about Peter. These men are taken up into the mountain, or go up into the mountain, enter the cloud. They are being set up as a new Israel with them, as it were, the, the ones who are called to this extreme experience. And, and this is, again, 2 Corinthians 3. We each, Paul says, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and he means the glory of the Lord Jesus, and are changed into that same image from glory to glory. That is, as the glory is shone off or reflected off the face of Moses. So he says it is reflecting off our faces as we look at the glory of Jesus. So many times in the New Testament, the experience of Moses is set up as the basis for our experience. We're all like Moses. That's the simple idea. And this was very difficult for people who had grown up in Judaism to understand that really and truly 
I, as an obscure little person, could be that could be that close to God? Surely we should leave this to the uh, to the specialists. And of course, they would have thought of the other theophanies of men like Ezekiel, the prophets, saw uh, these things, and Isaiah uh, saw his glory. We are told, but then we are told we also have seen the glory. And so, what I'm saying is that there is the on one hand religion, and on the other hand, there's personal spirituality. In the mindset of religion, these great spiritual experiences are had by a few chosen, a very super pious, godly spiritual people. This is the mentality of stained glass windows, <coughs> whereby the saints are presented as stained glass figures, rather caricatured and unreal. And we poor people are just coming along and, and sitting, as it were, in church as mere attenders. <coughs> <coughs> as mere sort of spectators at a show. That's the, the problem. That's the impression that religion gives. And I, well, shall I be saved? Well, I don't know, but my idea is that I, I just attend and I am faithful as far as I can be. Now, Jesus and the New Testament are taking all these ideas and saying, no, you are the one who can have that special experience. You are the one who can go through what Moses did. You really can go through this. You can see the glory of the Lord Jesus insofar as you focus upon him. As Paul says, we each, each of us, even those apparently unspiritual people in Corinth, Behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord Jesus. And insofar then as we focus then upon him, which is what we're trying to do as we break bread, we see his glory. Insofar as you take time to reflect upon him as a person, you see the beauty of his character and you see the, the glory of the Lord. That's what you see. In his personality, you see the name of Yahweh, all the different characteristics, his patience, his love, his forgiveness, his grace, his justice, his judgment of sin. You see all that revealed. And you are changed into that same glory, bit by bit. You see, this is where being focused on Jesus is what it is to be a Christian. This is what it's all about. Having this, the mind of Christ, being focused upon him. And so, they're being set up then as these people who were going through what, what Moses did, entering into the cloud, seeing the glory of the Lord. But they were very far off that kind of level, and the record brings that out. I mean, Peter feels sort of, oh, you know, like, um, can you, uh, should, should we do something? What can we do? Should we make some tents for you? Should you make tabernacles so you can stay here? You know, and it, it, it said they didn't know what to say, they didn't know what to do. And when they come down from the mountain, well, they're still uh, confused, verse 11. They asked him, you know, why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? And they questioned among themselves when he said, you know, don't tell anyone about this until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. They said, um, well, what is the resurrection of the dead? They questioned, we're told, amongst themselves um, <clears throat> what the rising from the dead should mean. Well, it seems to me that they were too much under the influence of Judaism. Because the Sadducees said, there shall be no resurrection of the body. The Pharisees said there would, <clears throat> that there would be. And so they were thinking, uh, he says something about the resurrection. Well, I wonder if that's going to happen. Sadducees say it won't. Pharisees say it will. Mm, who knows? Mm, difficult. You see, they're very immature, but they are still set up as the ones the Lord is going to use. He doesn't say, look, you've got to get it all clear about the resurrection and the coming of Elijah, and then I'll give you a treat. Then I will show you the glory. No, it's a bit like they say, why do you break your bread 
with tax collectors and sinners when they're clearly not on a very high moral level and he says because I'm a doctor and I came to call the sick to repentance in other words by showing them ahead of time my fellowship my table accepting them and here by showing you my glory when you're not quite ready for it this will bring you to see the wonder of it all so you, the Lord's table this bread and wine that we take is not for the elite it's not for those who get it all it's not for those who've got everything in order it is for all men but by our experience of it as he said I, I share my bread I broke my bread with tax collectors and sinners so that they might repent and so here in this bread and wine that you might take in your car that you might take in in your in your flat late at night that you might do in an odd moment maybe at work maybe you're working such long hours all you can do is to occasionally just slip aside into the toilet and sit there for 10 15 minutes and break bread I was in a position like that in my life once when I was younger many years ago that's all I could do well okay then that's what you do and there in those moments with all you, the inappropriacy of the situation with all your smallness you see the glory of the Lord and bit by bit we are changed into it despite the fact that they didn't get it all they didn't understand it all now we, we think therefore well how can this really be um, that little me could have such significance su such meaning uh, but that is what it is to believe you see belief in the love of God is not simply knowing about the love of God it is trusting that this is all true for me <clears throat> but of course we we react against it uh, because if this is true it demands everything of me that I am actually in touch with the one true God and with his son who loved me as Paul says the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me well that that demands everything from me in response absolutely and so we are asked therefore of course to, to follow Jesus absolutely to, to, to pick up his cross and follow him and I think that Peter had this difficulty with doing that absolute difficulty with doing it and so many times you see in Peter's life I think um, the, the way that he does not want to respond to the cross he doesn't like the idea of it when Jesus said I'm gonna die on the cross in Jerusalem he um, you know, Peter says oh no don't do that don't die on the cross you know and he, Jesus says get behind me Satan you're an adversary to me uh, in other words you walk behind me Peter you're supposed to be picking up your cross and following after me well don't tell me not to die on the cross just because it implies that you must and I think there's a little bit of that here because Peter says to the Lord look you know the uh, idea of the conversation with Moses and Elijah Luke says was to talk about his exodus that he was to accomplish at Jerusalem and Peter says oh let, let me make some tents why don't we just stay here you know this is the kingdom why don't we just stay here don't well, worry about this exodus, this death that they're talking about at Jerusalem. Well, let me make some tents and we can stay here. This is the kingdom without the cross. So again and again, he doesn't quite get it. And I think it's the same with us, that the real idea of giving our lives for Jesus is very difficult. And it's difficult because we, we tend to look at it all negatively. Oh, this is a big price to pay rather than seeing the wonder of the fact that he knows me and he loves me and he really wants me to be with him <clears throat> and I have seen his glory this is for real well sure I want to give my life for him absolutely so then I think Peter at the end of his life though he got it because he he said it's time for me talking about his death to take down my tabernacle my tent I'm gonna take my tent down soon he says he's talking about his death whereas before at this point he'd been saying oh Lord let me build a tent let me make a tent so you haven't got to go through with dying on the cross 
So I think he got there in the end, and I think we all get there in the end, that this life is about losing. This life is about death in the end. That we might live. You know? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, Peter says in his letter, that he may exalt you in due time. Well, <clears throat> that's why the voice says, when there's Peter saying, oh, what should we do? We should make a tent. The voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son, hear him, listen to him. And that's quoting, really, from Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where <clears throat> we're told a prophet shall the Lord raise up unto you, and him shall you hear. And it was amazing, I think, it's an amazing idea that the God <clears throat> who said that in Deuteronomy, who had inspired those words in Deuteronomy 18, that a prophet shall be raised up, Messiah, and him shall you hear, now actually speaks his own <laughs> words out of the Bible, as it were. Amazing. And says, this is my son, hear him. Now, in Acts 3, when Peter has learnt some more after the Lord's resurrection and he's now preaching, he quotes that. He quotes Deuteronomy 18, 15, uh, you know, that a prophet uh, has been raised up unto us, a Messiah, and hear him. And to him shall you listen, hear him. And he quotes that and he applies it to his audience. Because that's the voice that he heard that said, Deuteronomy 18.15, Peter, this is Jesus, hear him. And he does. Although he was distracted with his idea of building his tents and all that. And that's why he then says to people, to his audience, this is God's son. You hear him like I had to learn. So all the way through his witness as with ours is based upon our own recognition of fallibility, our own personal uh, difficulty in responding to the message. Well, he comes down from the mountain and there's the little boy there who's, who's sick and his father's very distraught, the disciples couldn't cure him. And the boy has been casting himself into the fire and into water. Well, to be cast into fire and water in the Old Testament are all images for condemnation. So the boy may be feared condemnation. And Jesus cured him. Sure, he cured him by a miracle. But I think the abiding cure was in understanding, psychologically, that condemnation is now dealt with. That you are forgiven through me, and you are okay. This shall not happen to you. But the point I want to fo <clears throat> focus on, really, is the way that the man, the father, says to Jesus, if you, if you can do anything, please do. And Jesus, as he often does, turns it around and says, you, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. So the, the man is saying to him, look, if you can do anything, please do. And Jesus is saying, me? Can I do anything? I can do anything. Absolutely, literally. But you, can you believe? In other words, you are, as it were, you've got your hand on the volume control. It's you that can limit what I do for you. Yeah, Luke 1, uh, all things are possible with God. With God, all things are possible. But here, all things are possible to him that believes. So, our lack of faith tends to be because we imagine that God is somehow limited. He is unlimited. With God, all things are possible. But the issue is, do we believe? Now, when we say all things are possible, I don't mean rabbits jumping out of hats and, you know, well, that sort of thing. The ultimate thing that we want to be possible is really our salvation, the forgiveness of sin, and the life eternal. And that is absolutely so. And in one sense, all you've got to do is say yes. <laughs> With God, that is all possible. The fear that this boy had of condemnation, jumping into fire, jumping into water. Look, it's all dealt with, if you believe. It's, you, it has to be up to you, because God cannot treat you as a puppet. You know, God will not put you on a leash and drag you there, because man is, man is not a dog. And God will not treat us like that. He wants us of ourselves to say yes and to trust and believe. 
Well, the man says, I think he gets it, but he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I'm sure we've all identified with that, because it is quite possible to believe and disbelieve at the same time, just as human motivation is never pure. So it is with faith. Faith is never absolute. People say, oh, he had total faith. I totally believe. I mean, no, you don't. Rubbish. Nobody does, apart from Jesus. You know, it's just not real. The real picture is, I believe, but I disbelieve. That's how it is. Now, if you're honest with yourself about that, like Paul says, you know, I see two people fighting inside me. Yeah, the good that I would, I don't do, and the evil that I hate doing, I do. Yeah. Um, the more you understand that about yourself, I think the more generous you'll be to other people. Because some of the hardest people to be kind to, to forgive, to accept, are people who know God's truth and actually believe, but they act at times in a very bad way. And you think, well, therefore the guy's fake. No. Because you also believe and disbelieve at the same time, unfortunately. And that's one of the great joys I think we'll look forward to in the kingdom. The, the, you know, we shall be changed. That, that shall be no more. And so the man says, look, I believe, but help my unbelief. You see, he was quite mature. Jesus is willing to help our faith to grow. It's not simply that he says, look, this is it. If you believe, you will not be condemned. Don't have phobias about falling into the fire and water and fears of condemnation. Don't worry about all this. Just believe. And the man says, well, I believe, but have my unbelief. And Jesus doesn't say, well, I can't do any more. You know, I've done a lot, and I'm going to die for you on the cross. I'm sorry, sir, but, you know, you've got to believe it. I can't do that for you. Oh, really? The man says, help my unbelief. And that is so. Jesus can help unbelief. Faith, Ephesians 3, is a gift from God. He is willing to help us. And when he says, help my unbelief, this is the same Greek word you got in, the, in Hebrews 2, and we're told that because the Lord had our nature, he is able to succor or to help us in our time of temptation. So the help, you know, help my unbelief, yes, indeed. Jesus is willing to do even that if you ask him. Truly, he died because he wanted to save us. That is absolutely so. He died because he loves us and because he so passionately wants to save us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread in which we see the communion, the fellowship of the body of Jesus. And we thank you for it all that you do want to save us, we who are so obscure, we who are so weak in understanding and action, we thank you that it is your desire that we should not be tormented by fear of condemnation, but that we should believe that we have passed from out of death, out of darkness to life and light. And we pray that you, through the Lord Jesus, will help our unbelief. For his sake. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this cup in which we see the symbol of his blood. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you in your great love will forgive us our sins and accept us into your kingdom. When at last we shall see him as he is, in his glory, and we shall be made like him. That, Father, is all our hope, all our desire. Amen.